Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Wollongong Library and to the exhibition um, launch of Captured. My name is Margie Janty, I'm the Director of Library Services here at the University of Wollongong. It's so lovely to see a number of familiar faces uh, and uh, we're very grateful that you could join us this afternoon. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Alauri, Wadi Wadi and Dharawal peoples whose land we stand on today. We pay our respects to the Elders past, present and those of the future and we extend a warm welcome to all Aboriginal peoples here today. Extend a, love, a warm invitation and welcome to our uh, speakers today. We'll hear today from Adam Lindsay from the New South Wales State Archives, who's a Director of Collections, Access and Engagement. We'll also hear from Penny Stannard and our speaker, Professor Sue Turnbull. And um, I can't wait to introduce you, Sue. Um, <laughs> your CV is, is amazing. So to begin with, I will introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Sue Turnbull. Sue originally is from the northeast of England, where she completed her undergraduate studies in English literature. While she was a student, she helped out on archaeological digs, examining a black, black death mass grave of 14th century monks. <laughs> that must be a great party line opener. <laughs> it, it just has to be. Uh, she's worked um, as a secondary teacher of English drama and film in England and America before <coughs> embarking on her academic career. She has a PhD in media and communications from La Trobe University in Melbourne. Many of you may have heard Sue as she is a regular commentator on media issues and is much sought after as a public speaker and panellist on a range of media topics. And if you're a fan of ABC quiz shows, you may have seen her as a regular Brains T Trust panellist on ABC TV's The Einstein Factor. So she's also someone to look for when you go into a trivia competition. <laughs> uh, she's a long-standing reviewer um, of crime fiction for Fairfax Press. Um, and she's intimated that she does have a family history that includes criminal activity of the horse rustling variety some time ago in Great Britain. Um, so, we've also noted that in this travelling exhibition there is a Belinda Turnbull included um, in the more fulsome online version of the, ex of the exhibition titled The Worst Woman in Sydney. Um, is she a relative or not? Perhaps more will be revealed. Uh, Sue's areas of research interests cover a range of topics including media audience research, television studies in general and the representation of crime in the media. She's a national convener of Sisters in Crime Australia and has been a judge for the Victorian Premier Literary Awards, the Age Book of the Year and the Ned Kelly Awards for Australian Crime Fiction. She's part of an international research team exploring transnational success of Danish crime drama series led by Professor Anne-Marette Anne Wade at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. And she's the current discipline leader for Creative Industries Cluster that includes media, journalism and graphic design. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sue Turnbull. I'm exhausted already. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the opening of this quite wonderful exhibition that provides us with such a powerful lens through which to glimpse the vivid past of these ordinary, extraordinary people who have been captured, both literally and figuratively, by the camera. I suspect that my, quali my qualifications for participation in this event lie in the fact that I, too, have been identified as living a life of crime. In my case, however, this begins with reading Sherlock Holmes at the age of nine while recovering from scarlet fever, and includes my watching of every crime drama series I could ever find on television from the 1950s onwards. We won't mention the nicked pencil sharpener. <laughs> this is a life that, as mentioned, now includes my crime fiction reviewing for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, and a current ARC discovery that is tracing the transnational career of the TV crime drama a project that has taken me to both Denmark and, most recently, Iceland to gleefully practice the kinds of dark tourism that such crime reading and watching can inspire. 
But here's the difference between my career in crime and the stories we encounter here. The crime narratives I have lived and breathed are inevitably fictional, even if they were inspired by events and issues in the real world. Michael Robotham, for instance, is a crime writer who collects tantalizing news snippets which fuel his imagination and his successful thrillers. As fictional narratives, the diverse genre of crime fiction and the TV crime drama that I relish provide me with a comforting and familiar aesthetic framework through which to contemplate the kinds of crime that would keep me up late if they were real. And to be honest, I have tended to steer away from what is usually defined by publishers and screenwriters as true crime. My avoidance is based on the presumption that I might find these stories too real, too affecting, too moving, and too disturbing to allow me to sleep at night. It was, therefore, with a kind of eager trepidation that I approached viewing an exhibition that confronts us with these haunting, real faces from the, fa from the past. Faces that look back at the camera or off to the side with the sobering knowledge that they have indeed been captured in time. What these people also knew was that these photographs were being taken for a purpose, as an aid to identification and apprehension, should these prisoners ever have the temerity to commit a crime again, as many of them did. These images were taken not for the process of memorialization, but as an exciting new development in capturing criminality, like the use of fingerprints that would emerge in this period, or DNA today. What these people could not know is how we would look at them here in this exhibition, framed by the passage of time where they look out at us as we look back at them with, well, what? Artistic appreciation for the quality of the image, curiosity, condemnation, or compassion. What do these faces tell us about the past, about us? I suspect everyone here will find a different kind of connection or entry point into these stories. For example, reading through the exhibition catalogue, I did indeed pounce on the story of Belinda Turnbull, the worst woman in Sydney, who it turned out was an illegal abortionist. As a Turnbull, I knew that I was descended, like our current Prime Minister, from a series of 18th century horse thieves and rustlers on the Scottish borders. But Belinda's career in climb was clearly a new departure for the notorious Turnbull clan, and one that was very much a product of its time. And then, as the mother of a now not-so-young son, who I always imagined as a victim and never as a perpetrator, I fixated on the innocent face of young Arthur Astill, who killed his employer with a gun after apparently tripping over a pet kangaroo, as you do. Accused of murder in 1893 and accused of harboring a precociously vicious sexuality. Look at him. Arthur was subsequently found not guilty. After his sojourn in Dubbo jail, he returned home to work with his father as a blacksmith, to marry and to have a large family before dying as recently as 1964. And then, just next to Arthur, is the story of the two Aboriginal trackers from Fraser Island, Willie Kenham-Burry, aged 24, and Jackie Bulliel, 25. A story clearly, clearly crying out to be remade as a feature film. These two men with their limited command of the English language were employed as skilled trackers by the Victorian police in Benalla, subsequently accused of an assault on very dubious grounds and then charged with murder following a spearing, which was most probably an act of defense. After eluding the police for two and a half years, the two men were eventually captured and sentenced to death. A sentence that was commuted on appeal following a public meeting that insisted that the men were neither 
cunning criminals, nor malicious. Someone, somewhere, was speaking up for them and saved their lives in an act of compassion we can only applaud. Each of these stories and all of the others that you will discover around the room and in the accompanying catalogue presents us with a fascinating glimpse of a past that was far from uncomplicated, in which people lived complex lives that are written into every feature, every wrinkle, every shadow of these extraordinary images. Apparently, there are 199 jail photographic description books held by the State Archives and Records, New South Wales, recording the images of 46,000 different people just like these, who came into contact with the law from 1870 to 1930. So what we are looking at right now is just a tiny piece of the puzzle that is the past, a past filled with thousands of stories begging to be told. And I may just be a convert to true crime. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Turnbull. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you, introduce to, um, you to Adam Lindsay. Adam is the New South Wales State Archives Director of Collections, Access and Engagement. In this role, he is concerned with caring and maximising access to the state's globally significant collections of archives, which predate settlement in 1788. Prior to his appointment, Adam was the Assistant Director of Queensland Art Gallery the Gallery of Modern Art. In this role, Adam was part of the executive team who planned and delivered the gallery's highest ever attendance result, secured the exhibition Marvel, creating the cinematic universe and produced the gallery's first sustainability policy. In his time with the Australian Government, Adam oversaw the delivery of digital television to remote Indigenous communities. In 2013, as Director of Broadcasting Programs with the then Department of Broadband, Communications and the Digital Economy, Adam led the negotiations with Australia's commercial broadcasters to realign the broadcasting spectrum used for electronic news, gathering in order to release Government's digital dividend auction result. Adam holds a double degree, a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Business, majoring in Peace and Development Studies and international business, respectively. And he also has a Bachelor of Arts with Honours in Political and International D Studies, obtained through a completion of a dissertation of an arts-based social change and a Master's of Arts in Media and Communications. Please join me in welcoming Adam Lindsay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather the people of the Darabal country. I'd also like to pay my respects to the social, cultural, artistic, economic and spiritual contributions and connections of Elders past, present and emerging. Margie, thank you very much as Director of Library Services for the University of Wollongong and the MC. Thanks for coming and thank you for having me and thank you for that introduction. Senior Professor, Communications and Media, Sue Turnbull, thank you very much for coming and speaking. And Dr Penny Stenard, the Exhibitions Curator, Thank you for coming as well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to be here this afternoon uh, at the Panizzi Gallery within the University of Wollongong Library. Wollongong University Library serves an important role in making significant archives from the State Archives Collection accessible to local communities. As one of our seven regional archive centres, it operates under a special partnership with New South Wales State Archives. Starting in 1963, the Regional Archive Centre program has evolved into a network uh, of partner organisations in Wagga Wagga, Broken Hill, Armadale, Windsor Caribbee, two in Newcastle, and between them they ho house over 4,000 linear kilometres from the New South Wales State Archives collection. Captured Portraits of Crime is the second exhibition that the University of Wollongong Library has presented in partnership with the New South Wales State Archives, and it's one of the six venues on the exhibition's regional touring circuit. So far, the exhibition has toured to Broken Hill. It's been to Maitland, Wagga and Newcastle, where it's been seen by 12,000 visitors. After its time here, it will tour to Armidale. The Captured Portraits of Crime exhibition is a smaller version of a major exhibition which is now at the Western Sydney Records Centre 
and it explores the stories of 13 men, women and children incarcerated in New South Wales jails between 1870 and 1930. The material, it originates from a very special part of our collection, as Sue spoke about, the New South Wales Jail Photographic Description Books. In 2016, the New South Wales State Archives digitised 46,000 pages from 199 jail photographic description books, representing 20 jails across the state. This was a part of a, a larger project to preserve material and archives in the collection that were at risk, uh, but it was also part of making them more accessible to communities using digital technologies available to us today. Captured portraits of crime, like our exhibition program more generally, functions to increase the depth and the breadth of public engagement with our collection. It's an area of primary focus for my team and I, and it's also an area where we're excelling. The exhibition catalogue that you can see here has received over 400,000 impressions online since it was launched in September last year. So with all that said, I'd like to acknowledge and thank you again, Margie, for the support that the University of Wollongong Archives shows us and the commitment towards our partnership. I'd also like to acknowledge Philip, Philippa Webb, Karen Aleska and Grant White and all of the members of the University of Wollongong Library team because each day you care for the state archives and make them accessible to communities, to researchers uh, and to people in, in Wollongong and beyond and we appreciate that. The, start, uh, sorry, the State Archives collection is valued at almost a billion dollars and it consists of some 13 million items. It's one of a, a globally significant collection and it's one of the cultural treasures of this state and I'm delighted to share it with you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, for that warm acknowledgement of the University of Wollongong archives. I now invite Dr Penny Stannard to deliver the keynote today. Penny is familiar to many of us, um, it's, but it's always a pleasure to introduce you. Penny has carved out a multifaceted career over two decades as a senior curator, educator, research, researcher and public policy maker, working in the government and non-government sectors. Through these experiences, she has developed a unique methodology that applies creativity and culture towards public engagement and knowledge making to deliver strategic outcomes within the education, health, veteran affairs, arts and creative industries. And includes first people, aged and disability fields. Penny has been the senior curator of exhibitions at New South Wales State Archives since April 2016 and she's recently curated and produced Blaze, Working Women, Public Leaders, and that's coming to us soon. She is a Deputy Chair of the Sydney Chamber Opera and was previously Chair of Ausdance New South Wales. She served on a number of New South Wales Government Arts, Grants and Advisory Boards and is a former Australia Council peer. Penny holds a PhD from the University of Technology in Sydney in Public History and Creative Industries and she has published both in Australia and internationally. Please welcome Penny. Thank you, Margie, and good afternoon, everybody. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present. It has been a great privilege for me to curate the exhibition Captured Portraits of Crime, and it explores the stories of men, women and children who were jailed in New South Wales between 1870 and 1930. And the exhibition that you see here today, as mentioned earlier, is one in a series of three exhibitions, which include the online exhibition, which launches as an e-book through the State Archives website, and a larger exhibition that is currently being presented at the Western Sydney Records Centre in Kingswood. As I said, or as it's been mentioned, the exhibition um, engaged with a record set of 46,000 pages or individuals that um, document and photograph people who were imprisoned in New South Wales. And there were 199 volumes of these records from 20 jails across New South Wales spanning 60 years. To work with a data set of 46,000 records to produce an exhibition was a great challenge. And it was something that required a very thought through curatorial methodology, um, one that was well planned and rigorously executed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The practice of taking photographic portraits of prisoners was something that um, evolved in New South Wales in the 
the late 1860s, early, 19, early 1870s. And it was introduced um, by the then sheriff and acting inspector of prisons, a fellow called Harold McLean. And he'd been to the UK to study prisons over there. And in particular, to look at things such as prison productivity, the management of um, prisoners in terms of solitary confinement, those sorts of things, and also new technologies in terms of the identification of criminals. And he brought back with him to New South Wales a recommendation that the authorities implement the system of photographing, photographing prisoners here soon after they were, um, or soon after they started to serve their sentence. While he introduced that practice here in 1870, it had been introduced elsewhere about 20 years beforehand. In the 1850s in Paris, the authorities introduced the practice of photographing criminals when there was an influx of what, they, um, what were then called strangers to the city or vagrants. So as people were relocating from rural France into Paris, there was such an influx of um, homeless people um, who were unknown to the authorities. So the police uh, passed a special vagrancy act to actually photograph these unknown criminals. They weren't so concerned with the ones they knew, which were the thieves and you know, sort of petty pickpockets. It was the unknown criminals. So the lens of the law was really focused very much on homeless people. In the UK, the lens was focused very much on the uh, travelling criminal. So people were moving from county to county, changing their names, and authorities couldn't keep track of who was who and who was where. So they thought by actually photographing them, by having that visual proof, that would assist them greatly in sort of disrupting uh, what the status quo was, and it was successful. But the practice of photographing prisoners had supporters and detractors. Some critics drew attention to the fact that the uh, photography, portraiture was a bourgeois taste, and to actually employ it in um, relation to the criminal classes would somehow impact upon the respectability of the bourgeoisie. Others thought it would you know, really denigrate the art form and sort of bring them down with it. Others thought that by capturing a prisoner's face in what they understood to be a permanent thing would surpass any kind of sentence, any kind of punishment. And it wasn't about administration, it was more about this idea of a permanence of punishment. By the time it came to New South Wales, however, such debates had subsided and the, uh, the sort of technology associated with the camera was a lot more accessible and a lot more mainstream. When a prisoner was incarcerated, uh, was sentenced to, um, you know, given their sentence and then sent to prison, um, their pho the photographic portrait was taken quite soon after they entered the prison walls. And uh, in the case of James Dwyer, who's a fellow um, behind over here who's dressed in a lovely um, bow tie, he, that image was taken the day after he was uh, convicted of forgery and uttery at Darlinghurst Jail. And he would have been taken through the old uh, tunnel from the Darlinghurst Court through to Darlinghurst Jail, and he's still in his court finery. They were t the images were taken of the prisoners in their own clothes, and it was up to the discretion of the jailer as to who would be photographed and who wouldn't be photographed. Um, and the practice was, at least in the first generation of this uh, process, was to employ commercial photographers to come to the prisons and to take the photos. So a bit like how we might um, employ contractors today to do some of that work for us. As the prison population grew, as the technology became a lot more sort of imprinted in uh, the system, then corrective services then employed their own photographers. So it's quite interesting in terms of that there was this world of photographic artists who were being used to actually um, photograph these people. Over the 60 years uh, that are represented through this exhibition, the conventions of portraiture changed. So in very early cases, and you'll see if you have a look at the e-catalogue, the case of Sarah Clifford, her very early portraits which were taken in the 1870s are sort of from the mid-rift up, the three-quarter view. Within about 20 years, we get to the front and side on view, and by the 1920s, we get to the full body view, often with some kind of um, measurement metrics beside the body so that height could be documented as part of the photographic process. In the 1800s, a stereoscopic lens was used, and so that meant that as the person posed for the image, there were actually two lenses. And if you look very carefully in some of these cases, it's a very slightly different photo. The person's uh, eyes are very slightly looking in a different direction, a bit like the Mona Lisa. 
So that's fascinating in itself. And in some of them, we can actually see the reflection of the camera operator, which is really wonderful. But these are not just mugshots, because the records exist as a combination of textual information and image. And so in terms of developing an exhibition, it was really looking at the combination of information and image, not one by itself, but both together, and how that suggests a story, suggests a narrative that's right to be told. These are really unique records. And it is this combination of information and image that makes them really unique. As mentioned, there were 46,000 of these records. The, the volumes of jail books exist as heavy tomes of leather-bound pages. And the process of digitising those happened in, I think it was 2016. And so by the time I came onto the scene, I had this great uh, digital material to then work with. And you also have this digital material because you can go onto our website and look in our jails index and actually search by name, search by year, search by jail, and you too can find this information. So the process of digitisation has not only made this uh, material accessible to people like me, but it makes it to accessible to people like you and, and others elsewhere who would have all sorts of uh, potential interests in engaging with this material. And the process of digitising the material and putting it online raised a sense of renewed interest in, in these stories. So who are the men, women and children featured in the jail photographic description books? What can be gleaned from their brief biographies that appear on the page? How does the melding of information and image hint at the circumstances and events that led to their incarceration? Where did they come from? And why were they incarcerated? What can their individual stories tell us about the changes and developments taking place in New South Wales over 60 transformational years? So these are the sorts of questions uh, that really formed the basis of working with this material and creating an exhibition. This exhibition here tells the story of 13 prisoners. The online exhibition extends that to 37. And researching and piecing together these stories, um, you know, it was, it was a big job. Um, and I was tasked with turning an exhibition around in nine months. And so I needed to find a, a way to crunch the numbers, as I call it, in a meaningful way. And I chose to focus on the principal and the minor jails that existed in New South Wales at the time, and not the little police jails. So there was a police jail in Wollongong. I focused on the bigger jails, the Goldens, the Parramatta's, and the, the smaller, the minor jails, as they were called, like Broken Hill, Grafton, as it was at the time. I took a cross-section of years uh, from 1870 to 1930 and took 1900 as a midpoint and focused on the years around that. I delegated out to 17 archivists, approximately three volumes each, and the idea was to ask them as they turned the page or clicked, clicked to turn the page, what did they find compelling about what they saw? What was their gut instinctual response to the image and the information? And I asked them to frame that in terms of the five offence categories under the 1900 Crimes Act. Offences against persons, offences against property, the currency offences, petty offences and the disorderly or the offences against uh, good order. It was a fascinating process with 17 different people, I must say. Not only was it highly collaborative, but each person brought their own life experience, their own values, their own judgments into that uh, process. For me, the ones I found most confronting were the records of boys incarcerated for <coughs> you know, crimes in, in, and put in prison with adult men. I found that really confronting. Um, boys like Arthur Astle, uh, who Sue uh, touched upon before. For others, it was the women like Margaret Higgins, um, you know, women who were facing the, um, a future with an illegitimate child, women who had very few rights um, in relation to their future. Um, different people found different things really compelling and that itself was, as I said, a fascinating process. I also found uh, the story of um, Jackie and Willie very compelling as well and I did the research for Jackie and Willie, the two Aboriginal trackers. And as I was researching their story, and it's, it's a big story and it's been forgotten. Um, I came across some material at the State Library, as it was, that talked about how the public in Albury came together to petition the government to commute their death sentence to um, life. And there was a, uh, about five um, important men in the community, five aldermen, who were involved in taking their case to the Executive Council. And the last person on that list 
was my great-grandfather's brother. Now that's a piece of my family history I had no knowledge about and it was this serendipitous situation that I saw that name um, and that he was involved in petitioning um, their case. So these weird things happen on these projects. Um, over the years, as we've seen in film and television, in uh, the crime fiction that's out there um, and the non-fiction that's out there, some New South Wales criminals have almost become enshrined, or have become enshrined in our social and cultural history and legal history also. But this wasn't the focus of this exhibition. And this was a deliberate focus to look at ordinary people, to illuminate the stories of people who, for one re reason or another, choice, circumstance, led to a situation where they were incarcerated in a prison. And they're stories that have largely been forgotten to history. And considering their stories through the lens of today, and I talk about this as sort of an, an empathy that we can bring to how we might interpret the past. And it would seem that family poverty, homelessness, mental illness, intellectual impairment, alcohol or drugs underpin many of the stories um, within this exhibition and the broader data set. But there was also emotion, desire, greed, revenge, gratification, or the need for self-preservation. Those things also played a part. Crime was a way of life and opportunity for some crooks to make a buck, and it was certainly the case in this fellow over here called uh, Bernard O'Sullivan. Childhood neglect set a path um, of institutionalisation for many people, including potentially these two young boys here. But if you read about the case, you'll see that the judge was a very sensible man and um, really put it to the parents to uh, deal with the situation of these two boys so they didn't end up on a path of lifelong institutionalisation. Major events such as the First World War and the Economic Depression also played a role and underscored many, many examples of what were at the time uh, considered to be criminal offences. But many men, women and children acted in ways that contravened the laws of today and, and today their cases would not be prosecuted. Captured Portraits of Crime has been a project that has involved lots and lots of people, both with my colleagues at New South Wales State Archives, but also with a range of external partners, including my colleagues uh, here at the University of Wollongong Library. And without their skills, knowledge and expertise, and also their dedication, these records and these sorts of exhibitions couldn't be brought to light. So lots of people get involved um, at different points in a process um, to bring an exhibition like this together. And it's a true, um, uh, it, it's a really wonderful way to collaborate with a, with a range of people um, and a range of perspectives. And that's, I think, very important in terms of how we might create history and interpret history today. So I'd just like to say thank you to everyone involved, um, including especially my colleagues here today, um, and encourage you to um, read the stories that are on the, on the walls, but also on the online catalogue. It's always a privilege to be at a launch of an event like this. We admire the curator's skill in bringing these stories together and bringing them to life, but at the, at the launch, we get to hear so many other narratives and backstories that add another layer of richness to the story that's being shared with us um, through the exhibition panels. Very grateful to our speakers today, to Professor Sue Turnbull, Adam Lindsay and Dr Penny Stannard. Um, you have added a lovely story um, to, to this particular event. And I thank you uh, for your comments about the library's involvement and partnership in this. And I think that's because we share a same passion and a vision for transforming how people experience knowledge and information. And we can do that in so many wonderful ways. And there's many examples of that in this exhibition through the panels, through the, the digitised catalogue, through the interactive stories and so forth. So it's with great pleasure that we officially open, captured the exhibition that's travelling via the New South Wales State Archives. Thank you very much.